Um, so right now I'm just going to go through all the questions that I have planned, a little bit of review material for you guys um, for uh, your upcoming final uh, in your second quarter of circuit theory. So um, with that, I will go ahead and do a couple of things here, stop my video and share my screen. Here we go. Okay. You all see these are my notes from when I took the class. And here are my notes for the review session. So let's go ahead and get started with something very important, which is delta to y conversion. Um, so I'm sure the professor went over this, but uh, a delta circuit and a y circuit are two different uh, two port networks that you see a lot in um, your in circuits in general, and there is a specific conversion between the two. Um, and the reason that that's important is because they're not, it's not a simple conversion, but it's something that you'll probably encounter a lot of. So for example, um, or in general, I should say, if you want to describe the uh, Y components, so Z1, Z2, and Z3 in terms of ZA, ZB, and ZC, you would use this formula, um, where Z prime is essentially the uh, the <clears throat> it is the impedance that is uh, clockwise to um, the port that you're currently at essentially. So for n1 being this current or sorry the um, node that you're currently at. So for n1 being this node right here, z prime and z double prime are going to be zb and zc. If we're at n2, z prime and z double prime would be zc and zA. And then if you are at n3, it would be zA and zB. <coughs> and those are the conversions of uh, from a y to, sorry, from delta to y. For from y to delta, we have this formula, which is zp over z opposite. And zp is just z1, z2 plus z2, z3 plus z1, z3. Um, and z opposite is, so for in this case, we're looking at ZA, which is associated with N1. Um, and the opposite, oh, sorry, we're looking at ZA, which is associated with N2, um, because it is the only one that N2 does not touch. Um, and as a result, if you look at, oh, uh, apologies, if, Z opposite is just the, the opposite impedance. I don't know why I have to say anything more than that. Um, so in this case, for looking at ZA, it would be uh, Z1. OK, so uh, without further ado, I will continue and begin to talk about uh, YZ and transition parameters. So this is probably something that you started with with two port networks. Um, and the YZ and transition parameters are, and as well as hybrid parameters. Um, although from what I've seen, that isn't gone over too much. Uh, if Professor Drabi asks a question about it, uh, and I can go through them if you like me to, if you all would like me to, um, but I don't have any particular questions about them. Um, but the YZ and transition parameters are the most important ones because they describe the impedance um, or the admittance of the circuit. And the transmission parameters are especially useful because they allow you to essentially just do the multiplication of matrices to uh, describe transfer functions. Um, so uh, to start off, I will go ahead and um, go through this problem. Uh, if you guys would like, go ahead and take a couple minutes right now to attempt this problem on your own um, and see what you can do out of it. There are a couple ways to do it, um, <clears throat> but I find that there is a simple trick to it. So I'll give you guys probably about 10 minutes to try to solve it on your own time.
All right, I sort of feel strange just <clears throat> sitting here. Um, so I think instead what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, uh, well, I'll leave it up to you guys. If there's a strong opinion one way or the other that anyone has about whether or not I should go through these problems, uh, you guys can put it in the chat now or unmute your mic and say something. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, I will just start uh, working through the problem. Um, I know what it's like to be in a Zoom class, and I don't know how many of you exactly are, would be working on this right now. Um, not to diss you or anything, but I know how it is. Uh, so go ahead and put in the chat if you want some extra time to work on this problem, um, and I will wait a couple more minutes. Otherwise, I'll just go through it. Okay, well, I guess I'll start working with the problem. So um, let's go ahead and uh, look at the Z prep parameters of this circuit. So in finding the Z parameters of this circuit, I'm going to redraw this so that it's maybe a little more, um, makes a little more sense what I'm about to do. And hopefully you guys can see now after I redraw it that with all of these here, one farad, one ohm, one ohm, one ohm, that we can actually do a delta y conversion right here, um, specifically from a delta circuit to a y circuit. Um, and the reason that this will be helpful is because if we can get this into a form that looks as follows, uh, with some impedance here, some impedance here, and some impedance here. This helps us for two reasons. One, because uh, I guess actually there should be a resistor right here. Um, this helps us for two reasons. One, because we can simply add these two together. And two, because this is actually the form that a um, a Z parameter network takes when Z12 equals Z21. Um, and the general form of that looks something like this. Uh, if you guys have forgotten, I will put it up here. Uh, or actually even not even if Z12 is equal to Z21. I believe there's actually an extra term that we add in if, um, which is a voltage bias. Here, I'm running out of room. Where this is Z11 minus Z21, this is Z22 minus Z21, and this is Z12 <coughs> or Z21. Um, can't really read that. Z22 minus Z, oh, and this should be Z12 and 21. Uh, and then there's a voltage bias here, but the, this cancels out for this problem, so it won't matter. And also I'm going to go through the actual full analysis, but um, this is helpful. Uh, this particular model is helpful um, to know that we want to get a circuit into, or this circuit into this sort of form. So I'm gonna go ahead and label this as Z1, Z2, and Z3. Uh, and we already know that this is going to be 1 ohm. So the question is, what are Z1, Z2, and Z3? Well, first of all, uh, an important thing to note is that we know that Z1 has to be equal to Z2. I claim that we know this. Why? The reason um, is because, like many things, uh, circuits can be symmetric. And as a result, when we see a symmetry like this, Right. If I were to cut this right down the middle, right here, I guess if the, the capacitor was in the center there, um, it would be symmetric. It wouldn't matter if this was, you know, the input or the output, and it wouldn't matter what, you know, if I flip this circuit around. So as a result, it can't matter here as well, um, and therefore Z1 has to be equal to Z2. 
So in reality, we only have to find one of them, and then we find both of them. So let's go ahead and do that. What is z1? Well, we know from our delta y conversion over here, right, that if we want to find zy, we do z prime, z double prime, over the sum of every z delta. So in this case, what we want to do is we want to take, um, if we're looking for z1 right here, we want to take uh, the, resi the capacitor right here and this resistor right here um, to, in order to find z1. So uh, what we do is we say, I'll first actually put the impedances of these. So one farad goes to, oh, I'm, I should mention I'm going to be solving this in the middle of domain. So one farad goes to a resistance or an impedance of one over S. That's the impedance of the capacitor. And the impedance of the resistors is just one. So this means that we have a transfer, uh, a overall impedance, Z1, of 1 over S times 1 over uh, 1 over S plus 1 plus 1. So this is just going to be 1 over S over 2 plus 1 over S, which is just 1 over 2S plus 1. And that's also equal to Z2. OK, um, Z3 is now instead just going to be 1 times 1, which is each of these resistors right here and right here, over um, 1 over S plus 1 plus 1, which is just going to be S over 2S plus 1. So with this now, um, we can actually find what this full impedance is right here, which I will call, I guess, Z4. And we can say that Z4 is simply Z3 plus 1. And that is just going to be 3S plus 1 over uh, 3S plus 2 over 2S plus 1. OK. <clears throat> Any questions so far? This is just converting this into a circuit that looks like this. OK. So now. We're going to go ahead and find yeah, the Z. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, for calculating Z1, um, in the denominator, why did you do 1 plus S plus 1 plus 1, oh, like two plus ones? Ah, um, because of the uh, delta Y conversion. So as you can see, uh, if we're converting from a delta circuit to a Y circuit, the oh. every impedance is going to be uh, divided by the sum of all of the deltas. If you'd like me to go through the um, <clears throat> the derivation for this, I can do that. Um, but I'd prefer to do that after um, I go through all these questions. Um, however, uh, it's essentially just because of the formula for right now. But it does come out uh, as a result of the derivation. OK, thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. <clears throat> OK. Um, and again, that's just because we have two 1 ohm resistors uh, in our delta circuit. So we should have two of them in the overall sum of the impedances of the delta circuit. OK, so now uh, we want to figure out what our z parameters are. So we have this, which is going to be z11, z12, z21, z22, right? And essentially what this describes is it says if you have your two voltages, right, your, I guess in this case I labeled them v in and v out. So I'll relabel them here. This is v2, this is v1. This is going to be the same as Z11, Z12, Z21, and Z22 multiplied by I1, I2. There we go. So uh, the way then that we solve for, for example, Z11, Z12, Z21, and Z22 is we do the following. We say uh, that Z11 is going to be equal to V1 over I1 when I2 is equal to 0. And similarly, that Z22 is V2 over I2 when I1 is equal to 0. And then in this case, Z12 equals Z21. Um, and that happens uh, also when the circuit is uh, a reciprocal network. 
um, which means that it is, uh, oh, sorry, this when the circuit is symmetric, I should say. So when you can flip it over, it doesn't, it shouldn't matter um, which input is where, but Z12 and Z21 should be equal. Um, so, and this is just going to be equal to either V1 over I2 when I1 equals zero, or, uh, which is also in this case equal to V2 over I1 when I2 is equal to zero. Okay, so with that in mind, we can solve for Z11. And this is just going to be equal to, actually, let me go ahead and redraw the circuit right here. So our current circuit looks as follows. We have Z1 here, Z2 here, and then we have this, which I called Z4. And then we have the lower board. And this is V1 and I1 and I2 and V2. OK. So if we set I2 equal to, to 0, that means there's no current going in this way, um, which means that V1 over I1 is just going to be the total voltage across this and this, these two resistors, when um, when I2 equals 0. So essentially, just the, um, the series sum of these two resistors. So V1, uh, here we go, V1 over I1, which is Z11, is simply equal to Z1 plus Z4 which is uh, 1 over 2s plus 1 plus 3s plus 2 over 2s plus 1, which should just be 3s plus 3 over 2s plus 1. Um, and V2 over I2, as we will see, is similar. Because Z22, uh, sorry, because Z2 is equal to, I should have given these better names. Let's call them A, B, and C. Nah, I won't do that. That might confuse you guys more. Um, either way, because Z22 is equal to um, Z2 plus Z4, and because Z2 equals Z1, this ends up being the same thing as Z11. OK. Lastly, uh, we have our cross parameters, which is Z12 and Z21. And this is uh, equal to V1 over I2 and I1 equals 0. So if we set I1 here equal to 0, there's no current that flows this way, right? which means that there's no voltage drop. So the voltage drop across here, VZ1, is zero in this particular case. So what that means is that this voltage point is the same as this voltage point. So now V1 is just the voltage drop across Z4. And we know the current going through I2 is just going to, or sorry, the current going through the voltage across Z4 is just gonna be I2 times Z4 in this case, because I1 is zero. So that means that Z1 over I2 must just be Z4, which is just uh, 3s plus 2 over 2s plus 1. And so we have our Z parameters. So our full Z matrix is going to look something like, uh, let's see, I can take this out, and we get 3s plus 3, 3s plus 3, 3s plus 2, and 3s plus 2. All right. Any questions there? No? All right. Sounds good. So the next part of this question is to find now the transmission parameters of this circuit. And there are a couple ways that we can do this. We can either start back from the beginning and um, look at what the transmission parameters are in terms of the following. We can say, um, so we know that our transmission matrix is equal to some A, B, C, D. 
And we know that uh, this implies that if we have our output currents and voltages, V2, I2, this is equal to um, our A, B, C, D matrix multiplied by V1, I1, right? It's essentially the matrix that converts V1 and I1 into V2 and I2. And that is the point of the uh, transmission matrix. It's a, a transmit your, transmits your signal um, across the, uh, the circuit element. And if you've taken 101A, there is also another reason that it's called the transmission matrix. And that's because it is used to describe transmission lines. Um, so there's that connection. So if we want to do this, we know then that V2, or we can also write this equation, I should say, as V2 equals AV1 plus VI1. And this is that I2 is equal to CV1 plus D I1. All right. Now, with this in mind, uh, we can actually either go about and start finding A, B, C, and D by having, you know, for example, V2 over V1. Uh, sorry, this is A would be equal to V2 over V1 when I1 equals 0, and B is V2 over I1 when V1 equals 0, and so on and so forth um, for all the parameters. Or what we could do is we could say that in the same way that we have this equation right here, we also have a similar equation for our z parameters. And that's this equation right here. So we can essentially write this uh, matrix equation. I'm just expanding it out very quickly. I2 plus Z2, 2, I2. And we get this equation right here. And if we solve now for Z1 or uh, I2 and V2 in terms of, oh, that's wrong, in terms of I1 and V1, we can get our uh, transmission coefficients or transmission matrix parameters in terms of simply Z11, Z12, Z21, and Z22. Um, and the reason I do this is just because it's generally useful um, for you guys. You know, if you're on the test and, you know, you have the Z parameters of a network and you need the transmission parameters of the network, you can just use the matrix that I'm about to drive for you. <clears throat> so where do we start? Well, we see that this equation right here has V1, I1, and I2. So we can actually very easily convert this into an equation just in terms of I2 and just say that I2 is equal to 1 over Z12 times V1 minus Z11 I1. Next up, we can then use this and plug in I2 into this equation right here and say then that V2 equals Z21 I1 plus Z22 multiplied by 1 over Z12, V1 minus Z11, I1. And then from here, I'm just going to simplify this down to get something solely in terms of V2. Oh, sorry, totally uh, grouping the coefficients of I1 and V1. So we have then that this is Z22 over Z12, V1 plus Z21 minus Z22 Z11 over uh, Z12 times I1. Uh, and this should be, that's right. And so now we actually have our coefficients pretty clearly set out in front of us. We have the coefficient for V1 right here, and the coefficient for V2 as the grouping of these two. And then the, co oh, sorry, the coefficient for A, coefficient for B, coefficient for C, and the coefficient for D. 
So if I would write that then, I would write my transmission matrix as 1 over z12. And then this would be negative z11 over z12, z22 over z12. And then finally, z21 minus z22, z11 over z12. I'm going to write that a little bigger. Z Two two, z one one over z one two, and those are my coefficients. I am sorry about the noise. Give me one quick second. All right, sorry about that. Uh, do you guys have any questions, comments, concerns? One or more about why you're learning all these matrices? Anything? Um, I had a quick question. Sure. With the two values in the V2 equals equation, would that be the coefficients A and B in the transmission matrix? Ah, you're right. I have copied this down wrong. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let me go ahead and just see if I can quickly flip this around. And there you go. So that is what the matrix should look like. Thank you. Uh, that sounded like it was Evelyn. So I think, thank you, Evelyn. Um, although I'm not 100% sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, uh, Thank you regardless. Um, okay, so uh, from here you can just plug in our original values of Z uh, in our Z matrix to find what the transmission matrix is. For the sake of time, I won't do that right now. Um, but again, this is just the general matrix that can convert from Z into a T matrix. Um, and you could actually probably turn this itself into a matrix and then just do linear algebra to get all your conversions right, if you uh, feel so inclined to figure that out. All right, uh, that is the first question on YZ and transmission parameters. Any questions about this in general? I'll take that as a no and move on to the next question. So this next question is now about finding the voltage gain of a circuit that is defined by its Z parameters. Um, so essentially we have this, this circuit N or this, this two port network N where we know for N that its Z network is just some Z11, Z12, Z21, and Z22. So now the question becomes, we have some V, v in and we have some I should say V out, which is uh, across some load resistance, right? The, the general, this is like a, a general form of uh, plugging some circuit into a, an output, right? And, or over some load resistor, right? Connecting our network to some other network, let's say. And the question is, what is the gain of the voltage V in? Um, and what the gain is, in general, is, is the ratio of the output over the input. So all we really have to do then is from knowing that these are the parameters of this network and knowing the output and the input and being given RS and RL, we have to find then what this ratio is. So that's just gonna boil down to doing a lot of algebra to figure out what uh, v out, it, it, what everything is in terms of v out and v in, and also in terms of our parameters here, and in terms of rl and rs. So I will go ahead and go through that. The first thing I'll say is that we want to find what v1 is, because we know that v1 is equal to z11 i1 plus z12 
I2. Uh, and similarly, we would want to find V2, which is Z21 I1 plus Z22 I2. So we can actually also write these in terms of Vn, Rs, and I1. Uh, so for example, in this case, V1 is actually just Vn minus Rs I1, which I hope you can all see from this side of the network. And V2 is actually just equal to negative I2 over RL. So from here, I'm just going to start plugging and chugging, as they say. So we have this first equation right here. <clears throat> we have that V1, uh, sorry, Vn minus Rs I1 is equal to Z11 I1 plus Z12 I2. And we also have that, oh, I should mention that uh, V2 is also equal to V out. So as a result, we can actually then plug I2 equal to negative I2 over RL uh, equal to negative V out over RL um, into this equation as well, and say that this is then equal to Z11 I1 minus uh, Z12 over RL multiplied by V out. Now we can take the second equation and solve for it as well. So we know V out is equal to Z21 I1 plus Z22. I should say actually minus Z22 over, uh, let me see, RL V out. And from here we can solve easily, uh, with equation two, we can solve easily for I1 in terms of V out by just adding this over. So we get that one over Z21 multiplied by one plus Z22 over RL is equal to uh, times V out is equal to I1. And then from there, we can just combine, I should say combine one and two, or really plug in V out and, or I1 in terms of V out. And we get V in uh, minus RS times one over Z21 of one plus Z22 over RL V out is equal to Z11 times one over Z21, one plus Z22 over RL V out minus Z22 over RL V out. Doing a little bit of grouping and uh, dividing things out, we can get that V in is equal to V out multiplied by a very large expression, which is RS over Z21. Um, I'm gonna do a bit of quick math right here. So because these two are the same, we can actually just write this as the following. Essentially factoring out a one plus Z22 over RL from that, both of those, and then subtract off this right here. And so that means that the gain, which is V out over V in, is equal to this whole expression, which I will not write again, um, but to the negative one. Looks like there's a question in the chat. Um, Tebo, it looks like you are talking about uh, from before. You may be right about that. Um, you think it is the numerator is 3s plus 1 here, I believe is what you're saying. And I think 
if I add, yes, that's correct. Thank you. Um, that does change a couple of things. So this then becomes 3s plus 2. And then this becomes, oh, no, that doesn't seem right. Um, hold on. This is 2, and this is 3. Okay, I'll, I'll work this out later. Um, but uh, you may be correct there, Taylor. Uh, let me finish this problem right now, and I will go back to that after. Um, okay, so now the question, uh, so we found the gain now. Um, we found the relationship between V in and V out in terms of the input and output parameters. Um, now the question says, find Z in in terms of these parameters. Um, and you're probably thinking, wait a second, what is Z in? If you're not, you remember EE10 well. Congratulations. Um, if you are, like I did when I was posed this question actually in 115A, um, then you will be surprised to know that the input resistance is essentially the resistance that whatever load we have, so for this example, V in, whatever load that sees in as the network, right? So essentially we can black box this whole system, right? Where RS is the resistance inside the source. So technically the input doesn't see that, but we can essentially just say that everything on this side is some box, right? And to a certain extent, we can go further and say that this is just some resistance here based on what um, the VN looks like, or based on what the, uh, the, the source sees. So this impedance is what we're trying to find, and this is what is going to be the input impedance of the networks in terms of the impedances, in terms of the, uh, uh, the Z parameters of the network. Okay, so if we know that, what exactly are we trying to find in terms of the, the math of everything? We know this is V1 and we know this is I1. So that means that this is going to be V1 and this is going to be I1. So if we were to find what Z in is, we would actually just be looking for Z in, which is just V1 over I1 without setting anything equal to zero or you know any parameters. So this is not just Z11. This is, um, it, it's slightly more complicated as we will see. So what exactly is V1? Well, we actually did figure out what V1 it was before um, and we can actually solve it in terms of the input parameters. It is Z11 I1 plus Z12 I2. And we divide this by I1. So it's this whole expression is just Z11 plus Z12 I2 over I1. Now the question becomes, what is this? And this is where we have to do a little bit of uh, manipulation to figure out what this is. So we know, I, I'm gonna use the uh, second equation now for this. So we know that V2 equals Z21 I1 plus Z22 I2. But what else do we know about V2? Well, we know that V2 can also be described. Um, here, let me actually draw out the other end of the circuit really quickly here. Where this is I2. We know that V2 as a result of this is the resistance across the load and can thus be described as negative RL times I2. So from this, we can actually just get an expression that is just in terms of I1 and I2, <clears throat> which is the following, that negative RL I2 is equal to Z21 I1 plus Z22 I2. Um, with some quick manipulation, you can then, let me make sure I did that right, that does look wrong. 
Nope, uh, never mind. So with some quick manipulation, you can then find I1 over I2, or I should say actually I2 over I1 um, by subtracting this to the other side and uh, just doing the algebra. So this means that I2 over I1 is going to be equal to, uh, I'm going to, need to do an intermediary step. So we have I2, negative I2 times RL plus uh, Z22 is equal to I1 times Z21. So this means that I2 over I1 is equal to negative Z21 over RL plus Z2, uh, Z22. Now from here, we can go back and actually fully solve for Zn. So Zn is equal to Z11 plus Z12 times this expression, which we just found. And that is just the following. Z12, Z21 over RL plus Z22. And that is the input impedance of the network in terms of its input parameters. <clears throat> okay, any questions there? Let's see if anyone's saying anything in the chat. It uh, doesn't look like it. Okay. Uh, let me go back very quickly um, and just make a quick comment about this. Uh, let me see exactly what Taylor said. It, does someone see uh, the where the math is incorrect? Because I don't believe if, if my, my concern right now is, and we will come to this later, actually the next question is about this, that if this term is 3s plus 2, that would mean that this matrix is not invertible. But I don't believe that's true for this system um, because that would mean that it doesn't, uh, well, I don't wanna give too much away, but that, that would mean something about the circuit that I, I don't believe is true for this circuit. Um, so if someone has the answer to this, uh, please go ahead and type it in the chat and I'll make an edit here just so that everyone who's watching this video later knows what the answer is, um, but I don't want to take too much time up for it. Um, okay, so with keeping in mind uh, things like uh, matrices, this is a more conceptual question about Y and Z parameters. So it's possible that your professor brought this up in lecture, um, specifically these two networks, um, and go ahead and let me know if he did, um, but I still think this is good, Im important information to cover. So one of the following circuits only has Z parameters and one only has Y. Which is which and why? Um, so as you can see, circuit A is a circuit which in this case only has some sort of uh, impedance between uh, the top nodes and not, no connection at all between the bottom nodes, but there is some sort of, um, uh, I guess, in theory, some connection there. Uh, in the kind of converse of this, there is no connection, or there is a, a short between V1 and V2, and there is this connection between the top and bottom nodes that is Zx. Um, does anyone want to take a crack at this question in the chat? Maybe they want to, uh, feel free to un unmute your mic as always. Um, maybe you want to ask a question about it. Maybe you have some thoughts about it and you're trying to piece through it. Um, but I do want to give you guys some time to think about this. I think this is an important question uh, just, to, just to be able to think about.
Okay. Sounds like uh, no one wants to speak up. That's okay. Um, I'll just go ahead and go through the intuition for this problem. Um, so, uh, so I just want to make sure, can everyone still see my screen? I think something just happened to my computer. Yes, no. Okay, great. Um, so I'll describe this mathematically and then I'll go a little more into the intuitive side of things. So if we were to actually write out matrices for these, um, there's actually a really way to write out, for example, the Y parameters of this matrix, which already tells you which of these has, doesn't have Z parameters and which of these doesn't have Y parameters. But let's say I wanna write out the Y parameters for this matrix. I wanna write out I1 over V1 in when uh, V2 equals zero. Right? And what is this? Well, when V2 equals zero, then that means that the current I1 over V1 is just going to be, this is going to be ground, right? So that means that the current I1 is just going to be V1 over Zx. So this is just going to be 1 over Zx. Um, and you can do the same thing for I2 over V2, since this is going to be I2. And then what you can do is you can find I2 over V1, let's say, when V2 equals zero. And that's going to be negative one over Zx, because it's just going to be the negative of this current right here. And then you can similarly do I1 over V2. Um, and that would be, and I should actually say these are equal. So our matrix, our Y matrix here, is the following. I'll take this out. 1 over Zx, 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1. Now, as I said before, there's something important that happens um, when the matrix isn't invertible. Now, what happens when the matrix isn't invertible is that we can't have Z parameters, right? If it, there is a, is a fundamental relationship between our Z matrix and our Y matrix, and that relationship is that our Z matrix is simply uh, say is equal to the inverse of the y matrix or the y matrix is equal to the inverse of the z matrix um and that makes sense right in one of them you have i mean it's really just comes from this fundamental relationship right and if i were to invert this matrix and multiply both sides by it i would just get z inverse v1 v2 is i1 i2 and that right there is the same statement as y times v1, v2 equals i1, i2. So the fact that this matrix right here is not invertible means that we can't find z parameters for this circuit. Now, what is that actually telling us about the circuit is the question. It's telling us something about the relationship between, for example, V2 over I2 or V1 over I1. And what it's telling us is that the, the currents don't have, the currents and the voltages aren't, um, I guess the best way to describe this is that the currents and the voltages aren't, uh, related like we normally think that they are. Um, I guess there's no, there's no objectively good way to exactly describe this. But if we just think about what these quantities are, right? So let's say we set I1 equal to zero here. What do we get? So what we get is we get that I2 must be equal to zero if I1 is equal to zero, right? But V2 can still have a value. So what's going on? We have some value over zero, which is undefined or infinite, depending on whether or not you're taking a limit. Um, 
And so more or less what this is telling us is that even though we have I2, and even though we have, uh, we, you know, we might know I2, we might know I1, we might know these things, but they don't necessarily tell us exactly what V1 and V2 are. They can only tell us relatively what they are, if that makes sense. And that is relative to each other. Essentially, that I2 and I1 don't give us enough information to solve for V1 and V2. Whereas, knowing V1 and V2 does give us enough information to solve for I1 and I2. It's, it's, it's the fundamental relationship of how, um, of the reason that this matrix is not invertible, right? It's, it's spanning a, a linear space of one dimension. And that one dimension is covered by both our currents, but if we try to go back into a two-dimensional space afterward, if we try to, quote, invert this matrix, we can't um, because the matrix isn't invertible. And the same exact intuition applies to this. Uh, sorry, this is I2 equals zero. And this is actually, uh, so this would just be Zx, right? When I set I2 equal to zero, right? The current that goes down this way would be zero, but that doesn't mean that this current necessarily is zero, right? But we know that the voltage across both of them would just be Zx. And actually this applies to uh, Z, and this is also equal to, I should say, Z12 and Z21 and Z22. So what we get is we get a matrix, our Z matrix is our Zx1111. And again, this matrix is not invertible. And as a result, it has no Y parameters. Draw a quick line there. Um, okay, any questions there? All right, no questions. Sounds good. So uh, now I'm going to go on and talk a little bit about poles and zeros. Um, so the following is a simple circuit and I have just asked to find the transfer function and um, uh, to solve for V1 and V2. Uh, sorry, to solve for V2 if V1 is a certain value. Um, this is more or less what you guys uh, did for your first midterm. Um, I just figured I would, you know, throw it on there as a, as a final review. Um, but the professor asked me to go a little bit through poles and zeros. Um, for the sake of time and because I want to save some time at the end for you guys to uh, ask me questions or, you know, you maybe want to bring up a particular problem that I can help you guys solve. Um, I'm going to uh, skip this problem for now. Uh, I'm putting it up on the screen just so that anyone who's looking at this video can solve it on their own. It's a pretty straightforward problem um, and uh, doesn't require too much. The one thing that I will say about it, uh, so if you're trying to solve it on your own uh, and you're looking at this video later, just know that um, you know this is maybe spoilers. Uh, this is a voltage divider, right? This whole circuit is a voltage divider and operates as a voltage divider where this is our Z1 and this is our Z2. And you wanna be looking at, you always wanna be looking for quick little tricks like that, right? You always wanna be looking at, okay, how, how do I solve this, right? Uh, you don't wanna necessarily go through like no to mesh analysis all the time. What you wanna do is you wanna make sure that you can, that you can do something quick like this. And you always wanna be trying to do something quick like that. Uh, which brings me to the next problem. So this is a little more complicated of a circuit, but the only thing the circuit is asking is for us to find the zeros of, of it. Now, did Professor Drabi tell you guys the quick trick to finding zeros in a circuit like this? I will take that as a no. Um, if he did, maybe I'll, I'll start going through it and maybe if it sounds familiar, you guys can uh, pipe up if you feel so inclined. Um, 
But the essential idea behind finding the zeros of a circuit, right? What is a zero of a circuit? A zero of a circuit, let's say that this is our V1 and this is our V2. When we find a zero of the circuit, what we're saying is we're saying, we're finding where our transfer function is zero, right? And we can also describe you know, this as a system where this is our V1, this is some H of S, and this is V2. So where H of S is zero is also saying where uh, I should say no voltage goes through, right? No signal goes through. So the idea is to think about what would make a signal not be able to make it through this circuit, right? What are the conditions on which a signal cannot come out at V2? And the answer is that the requirements are that this right here is an open, that this right here is an open circuit, and that this right here is a short circuit. Right? If this is an open circuit, the voltage can't get through. It'll just bounce back. If this is an open circuit, it can't get through. It'll bounce back. And if this is a short circuit, it won't even try to go through. It'll just go this way and then return. Right? It's grounded. So the idea then is that as opposed to fully solving for your entire transfer function, right? You, saying like, oh, I'm going to do R1 parallel L1S, right? And I'm going to, uh, I don't know, add that in, you know, you have like a pi circuit, right? Or it's, you have your T circuit and you're trying to solve for the parameters, right? As opposed to doing all that, the best way to find your zeros is to just do the following. Let's call this Z1. Let's call this Z2. And let's call this Z3. So, uh, where does Z1, what, at what point does Z1 equal zero? Well, what is Z1? Z1 is equal to R1 parallel to L1, uh, L1S technically, which is equal to R1 L1S over R1 plus L1S. Uh, sorry, not where is Z1 equals zero. Where is Z1 equal to infinity is the question, right? Where does Z1 become an open circuit? And the answer is going to be where this approaches infinity. And this approaches infinity when this bottom term approaches zero, right? So what does that mean? That means that essentially we're just finding the zero or the a pole of this particular transfer function. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, actually, I'll just write it out because it's pretty easy to see. The pole is just going to be where S is equal to negative uh, uh, R1 over L1. And this has to be one of the zeros of this function right here, of this circuit right here. The other way that this is useful is, you know, if you do go through the full analysis of this, right, you write out the full transfer function and you want to double check your work, this is kind of an intuitive way to think about it. Okay, so the second one is going to be, I'll just do Z3 next. So we're looking for where Z3 is equal to zero. Now we know that Z3 is SL2 plus one over S C one. And we want to find where this is equal to zero. Um, so what we can do is we can then say that this is also equal to uh, S squared L two C one plus one. So what this means, and that's when it's equal to zero, is that when S is equal to positive negative J, times the square root of one over uh, C1L2. 
so when it's the resonant frequency of this particular um, uh, of this particular short, it just passes. It it's just shorted to ground. So that means that that the the signal does not transfer through. And lastly, where is Z two infinite? Well, like before, we're going to have R two in parallel with. Uh, let's see, is that R two? Yes, it is. In parallel with C two. Sorry, one over S C two. And this is going to be equal to uh, R two over S C two over R two plus one over S C two which is equal to R2 over R2, C2 times S plus one. So again, this means that when S is equal to negative one over R2, C2, we get a zero. And again, that would mean that this essentially forms an open circuit. Now, does anyone have any questions about that? Is there a similar like method or like shortcut for like finding pools? Um, so I remember asking my professor, who was Professor um, uh, Professor Maludi at the time. I don't know if you guys have uh, know of Professor Maludi or have him, and. The response is a little bit complicated, right? Um, the answer is kind of, because the idea is that you want something where your circuit um, blows up, right? Something where it, it um, the circuit kind of increases to infinity, right? And sometimes it's not easy to see what those are, but other times it is. For example, um, one perfect example actually is resonators. Uh, if you have a resonant circuit, right? Something like, let me go ahead and draw out. Let's see, you have like some input, some resistance. So let's call this R, L, and C. So a simple resonator, right? I'll say that this is some input and this right here, is the output. Let's say we're looking at the resistance across an inductor. We know that if we, if our input is at a resonant frequency, it's very possible that our signal just increases um, onto infinity. So if I were to actually, uh, and just so I don't uh, eat my words here, I'm actually just going to strictly solve for this. So this is just going to be R plus, uh, let's see, L, uh, LS plus one over SC. And so this is, if I multiply everything by SC, um, oh, this is not a good example. Let me get the, a better example is the parallel version of the circuit, sorry. So we have our resistor, inductor, capacitor. And then this is our output. And we're trying to find the transfer function. L, C, R. So um, this is just going to be R in parallel with L, S in parallel with one over S, C. And this is equal to one over one over R plus one over L, S plus S, C, which is going to be R L S over L S plus R plus L S, uh, sorry, S squared L R C, I believe. That looks right. Um, and we can see that this will have two poles, right? And those should be at, um, let me see, let me, let me divide this out. Hold on, uh, RLS over S squared plus one over RC 
uh, S plus one over LC. Yeah. And so you can see here that you have your standard um, some value A, let's say times S over S squared plus uh, two gamma omega not S plus uh, omega not squared S. I don't know, have you guys gone through um, damping and, and driven oscillators? Does this, I should say, does this form of this equation right here look familiar? Maybe he used beta instead of gamma, maybe he, or you know, one beta instead of two gamma. Um, maybe he didn't say omega naught, but d does, uh, and this should not be S, this should be that. Um, but does this form look familiar? I'll take that as a no. Um, oh, so you guys haven't even gone through damping. Or, okay, so you guys haven't gone through resonators. Okay. Um, in that case, either way, uh, there are zeros of this circuit, and they come in the form S. Uh, let me see if I remember this off the top of my head. They come in the form S plus sigma minus J omega and S plus sigma plus J omega. And those are the poles. Or so these are the, this is what the bottom expression looks like, uh, where sigma is some function of gamma and omega naught. Um, so you can, and, and you have J omega, right? So one of the um, poles of this, right? The, the, at the point at which this has a largest, its largest response would be when S equals uh, J omega, uh, when S equal, the imaginary part of S equals omega, or I should say equals omega naught. And in fact, if you were to actually just take away the resistor, what you would find, I shouldn't short anything. Um, is you would get this. And what you'd see is if you keep adding in energy into here, it's just going to resonate. And the energy that you already have here is just going to resonate. There's no way for it to dissipate. So it will become a pole and it will go to infinity. So you can't, so, so there is something that you can do, but it's not as simple as just finding, like, like finding the zeros is. Um, and there are a couple of circuits that you can work with. I would say that you always want to be looking for, unlike where with the zeros you want to look for, you know, where something becomes and uh, where, where the signal cannot pass through, you want to look for something where the signal is essentially amplified continuously, right? Where something keeps being added to itself or goes to infinity in some way. And those you'll, you'll find are often just called resonances. So there's that. Okay, well, um, with that, I don't have um, any more questions. I can go through the previous question, um, but right now I would like to take uh, the next, uh, hopefully the next about half hour to answer any questions that you guys have. Um, I'll go ahead and turn my camera back on. Hello everyone. Um, I hope that was helpful. And I hope that you guys learned a trick or two. What I often find with, um, especially with exams, it's just useful to have as many tricks under your belt as you can. You know, something where you can look at it and say, oh, I know this is right because this, or, you know, I can guess that it should look something like this. And so if I get an answer that looks different than that, then, you know, you know to recheck it or, you know, to say, hey, I can move on to the next question. Um, does anyone have uh, any general questions? Maybe there's a problem you guys want to bring up and I can go through. Okay. Um, in that case, I will go ahead and go through this very quickly. Um, again, this, uh, for those of you who are uh, familiar with this topic, this should look, this particular question should look um, not too difficult. Uh, it, you know, obviously involves taking the Laplace transform of some, uh, 
a time value function. So if you're not familiar with your Laplace transforms, then definitely uh, remind yourself of those. Is Professor Dorabi going to allow you guys to have like a cheat sheet? Is it open book, for example? Um, let's see. Open book. OK, so you guys will have access to all your cheat sheets and everything. Um, yeah, after I was, after about, I think, sophomore year when I took all these classes, and I had a lot of these memorized. Uh, ever since then, I have I've always needed a transform table. Um, so hey, if you haven't memorized, good for you. But really, don't feel bad if if you have to look at a table, and you know, don't like. Honestly, if it's taking up time on a test, don't even try to remember it. Just go for the question um, and memorize the page number where that where that transform table is, because um, it's always helpful. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn off my camera again, um, and go through these problems. If you don't know, the reason I turn off my camera um, is because I have to turn my computer into a tablet. Um, and that's how I write. So uh, let's go ahead and go through this. So um, like I said before, this is simply a voltage divider. So what this is, is we know that V2 is simply going to be equal to Z2 over Z1 plus Z2 times V1. Essentially just the, fu the function of voltage divider. So we know that this is R2 over R2 plus R2 in parallel with uh, L times S times V1. So H of S is just going to be this guy right here. And that's going to be R2 over R2 plus R2 times SL over R2 plus, oh, R1, my bad. R1, R1 plus SL. And I'm just going to multiply everything by R1 plus SL. And you get R2, R1 plus SL over R2 R1 plus SL plus R1 plus SL. Any questions there? Hopefully not. Take that as a no. Move on to the next question. OK, so now we have all these particular values. And the question is, what is V2 if V1 is e to the negative 0 0.4 t u of t? Um, so I'll go ahead and solve for V1 of s first. So if v1 of t is negative 0 0.4 of t u of t, and that means that v1 of s is 1 over s plus 0 0.4, um, which is 1 over 5s plus 2. Uh, my bad. This is 5 over 5s plus 2. So um, now we want to just plug values into h of s. And that's going to be 1 times 2 plus 5s over uh, 1, 2 plus 5s plus, uh, let's see, 2 plus uh, 5s. So this is equal to 5s plus 2 over 4 plus 10s. Uh, is that right? Yes, 10s plus 4. So this is actually just equal to 1 half in this case. OK. And from here, that doesn't seem right. Hold on. Sometimes when you're doing these problems, like on the board, for example, uh, you make a small mistake somewhere. Um, and you don't realize it until part of the way when you're going through. That's a, 
something that I've realized. But it doesn't look like it in this case. I guess I must have done the problem wrong earlier when I checked all my answers. I think you might have uh, R1 plus SL and you should have R1 times an RL or SRL. No. That's it. Thank you very much. So that should be that. And so this should be 15S plus two. Look at that. I knew it. Um, thank you to whoever said that. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, anyways, so this is just 5S plus two over 15S plus two. And if we find V2 of S, this is V1 times H, and that's just going to be 5S plus two over 15s plus 2 multiplied by 5 over 5s plus 2. These cancel, and we get 5 over 15s plus 2, which is equal to 1 third over s plus 2 over 15. So v2 of t, then, is going to be equal to simply 1 third e to the negative 2 over 15 t u of t. All right. Um, oh, I don't know what happened there. Those are my notes. So, if you guys have any questions about this, um, I'd be more than happy and willing to answer them. Um, Oh, I was just asking to scroll down a bit. Thank you. You're good. Okay. Um, one comment about systems like this in general. Uh, this is, you know, not necessarily fully relevant to the class, but is important for the theory. And I hope Professor Drawy mentioned something like this. When you have a zero as such, and when you have a pole as such, and more importantly, when you have a pole. In a real system, you will not necessarily, for example, uh, cancel the zeros and cancel the poles, right? Uh, my signal input, I might want it to look like e to the negative 0 0.4 t u of t, but it doesn't objectively look like that. Um, and as a result, what often happens is, especially with um, poles, if you operate around a certain you know, S value where um, it, it blows up your signal and you have massive gain, um, just because you use a signal that, quote, cancels that pole, uh, that will not necessarily mean that the output of your signal will not have massive gain. Um, and you know, you can, you can use that, but in your engineering, right, you can use it I guess maybe in amplifying circuits, um, but generally, you know, especially in, for example, control theory, um, it ends up being a problem and you don't ever wanna try to cancel your poles. And the same way with zeros, if you're operating around that zero point, um, and even if you use a pole to cancel that zero, uh, would, I guess actually in that case, if you use a pole to cancel the zero, then your pole would just kind of dominate and end up blowing up. Um, and that's really the, the important thing to recognize here. So even though we do all this theory, um, it's important to recognize in a realistic situation that it will not always be the case that, you know, if I were to plug in some zero, which is at e to the negative 2 over 15 t, um, or, you know, at the s value that is associated with this pole, that that would necessarily cancel that pole. Um, and that's it. And with that, if you guys have any other questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Um, I don't have anything else, um, any other problems that I felt were necessary to go through. I felt this pretty much covered everything the professor um, asked me to, uh, the, the different subjects that the professor asked me to go through uh, and more of a, a problem, you know, how to approach different problem side of things than necessarily a, um, uh, an overall, like, I guess, uh, review of everything. So, if 
if no one has anything else that they'd like to ask, um, then I just want to say I wish you all the best of luck on your final. Um, again, I know things are difficult right now, but uh, for us as electrical engineers, we can, uh, you know, we can persist. Um, and uh, I hope you all have a great weekend and rest well for your finals. And um, if you decide to let your voice be heard, then go out and do that. And if you decide to study your final, then go do that. Um, and either way, just make sure that uh, you're focusing on yourself. So, um, and making yourself feel good uh, in these trying times. So, thanks guys. And uh, good luck on your final. That's all.